Hello, hello, very happy to see you today uh, for this very unusual tour that will be an online tour. I have to say that this is not my favorite type of tour, but this is the reality of today. And I'm nonetheless super happy to be here with you. So I'm Rebecca Lamarche-Vadel, the chief curator of the second edition of the Riga Biennial. And suddenly it all blossoms. And we're going to be together for two hours, I think, something like that, to discover the whole uh, exhibition. So we are here in the first uh, hangar in this wide territory that is André Sala, where the Biennial is taking place. That is a territory that is 200,000 square meters and that really was imagined as an odyssey. The Odyssey starts with me, uh, starts with me, yes, but more than me with Hugo Rondinon behind me. Uh, this work is called Lifetime and we're going to go towards it. The idea with the work was that it was a, a kind of a riddle, a kind of a question asked to all of the visitors. Uh, the show is about the question of re-enchantment, which means how can we imagine other ways on, of inhabiting this planet? How can we imagine new ways, thanks to the artist, uh, to sense, to feel, to make relationship with others, may they be humans or non-humans? So basically here is almost a manifesto uh, from Hugo Rondinon, this idea of um, what is lifetime? Is it the time that is given to me as an individual? Is it a lifetime that is much wider than me and that dates like billions of years ago? And how am I responsible? What am I doing with this? I'm extremely thankful uh, towards all the artists and participants of this project uh, because you might have heard that the biennial was supposed to happen for six months, uh, which was supposed to open in May. And of course, we had to transform all plans and we're not uh, only opening for three weeks and we're going to shoot a movie about this project during these three weeks. So what you're going to see throughout the exhibition is many works that we had to transform, change, because they could not be shipped, they could not be finished. Um, and this work is one of them, actually, because it was supposed to be a, a neon rainbow poem, as it's very... Um, uh, and the famous series developed by Hugo, um, and we could not have it. So it got here, painted, made out of plywood, and basically the idea was to be extremely resilient and to accept to the limit to our powers with the exhibition and uh, its completion. So please follow me. Uh, follow me towards this little pigeon hole that acts a bit like uh, Alice in Wonderland, the idea that you're going to cross a threshold and that behind that we're going to see the, and encounter the propositions of the artist that acts as many guides for this thinking about re-enchantment. Um, lifetime is also, of course, uh, the colors of the community, a community that we want to include and a world that we want to be more inclusive. The idea is also that the rainbow is something that comes after the rain, after the storm, and, and suddenly it all blossoms is very much about that. Quoting Donna Haraway, for example, is like, how can we build together experiences of joy and enthusiasm? How can we suddenly re-enchant and be celebrative and be enchanted by different voices uh, in our ecosystems? So behind here, after the pigeonhole, uh, you will discover Bridget Polk. So I will speak much more quietly because um, basically Bridget Polk is uh, amongst other participants in the show someone who's not a trained artist, such, a, such as an academic or, or something. There are many participants in this project that kind of defy and challenge the territory of art by expanding it. And that was extremely important for me to invite people who are actually permanently challenging the idea of what an artwork is. And um, Bridget is a bit of a Sisyphus of our time. Uh, she comes here every day and puts together these impossible balances that are extremely fragile and that look impossible and that are actually made of different layers of stones from Riga. So you have here stones dating back from, of course, millions of years, but also used like in the 19th century to develop the city or much more recently to build some of the buildings that are in the territory. Bridges comes here, we never know how long what she puts together will last. It can collapse after two hours, after two days, after two seconds even. But Bridget comes here again as a Sisyphus and will every day bring back these words together that collapse eventually. 
I will let you have a look. Sorry. So we have a long way to go and I wish we could stay here to watch Bridget work but the idea is that this work is really inviting you to stay here as much as the visitors are now doing and meditate a bit and just enter a moment of great patience and resilience. to the next venue. Um, we just entered a, a world which is the one of Bridget Park that is about accepting that the world we put together and that we built will eventually collapse and that somehow this destiny or this fate has to be uh, accepted and this is maybe a proposition for today and, and our times. Now we're gonna go towards uh, what we call the little house, which is the region, I mean, the, the place where the workers, as we are here uh, in a very uh, industrial area, where the workers used to uh, spend time and uh, just put their, their belongings and have some cafes and rest and so on. And it's now the home of someone else, which is uh, Heinz Frank, an Austrian artist, who from the 70s till the 90s has been focusing on himself as well, reimagining the, reimagining the world we live in. And his proposition is what you're gonna encounter now is these drawings that are architectural drawings, propositions to basically unlearn the way we've been building uh, architectures and different buildings. And he's uh, proposing a much more wide approach. Uh, the idea being, as you see uh, around me, uh, to build following the animal world, but also to take over like a, a very classical architectural elements which has like uh, columns, Doric temples, and completely uh, hack them to propose something for the architects that would be more like a, a childish way of encountering the world and building it together. So you can have a bit of a look, of course, and I just um, invite you to look at this one more closely because we might see it appear a bit later in the exhibition. As you might have noticed, these uh, works were also uh, not originals, although I'm not sure you were able to see that through the lenses, but uh, these are also photocopies, which is quite unusual for a biennial uh, to present photocopies of original works. But again, like the COVID situation, uh, when it happened in March, faced, made us face like uh, something that was extremely uh, 
complex as a, as a situation and as decision making. And we decided that, okay, we're going to freeze the show as it is right now and just accept the limit of our power, the limit of our uh, strength in this situation and just accept that COVID will almost be a co-curator of this exhibition and will force us to find solutions and alternatives that we might have never thought about. And so we discussed like with every artist, every single artist of the exhibition, one by one, to try to find ways to manage to show works or adaptations of the works whatsoever. And so you will see throughout the show that many, many propositions had to be reimagined or, or readjusted. But for me, it makes really sense that today when like the COVID is a putting a whole civilization to its knees, accepting that this one of the smallest um, species of life, which is a virus, uh, just made a difference and how we can acknowledge this voice instead of trying to fight against it. And the idea as the show is about humility and modesty and how as humans we can just decentralize ourselves and revise a bit our position amongst beings, like just to accept that uh, yeah, things just didn't go as we wanted them to go. And you will see this exhibition has many gusts and has many moments of silences that are basically the screams uh, of, of our incapacity to pursue everything we wished for. Um, but to go on with the show, we are now arriving. You will see we will walk a lot. Uh, and that's also very important because I wanted to propose uh, to the visitors another rhythm. So they would go out of the city. They are here in André Salat. It is just 10 minutes away from the city center, from the incredible historical Art Deco uh, district. But it still feels like galaxies away. And this is um, a territory that's been closed for decades now. And that really wanted people to be able to enjoy it again, to discover it again. But following a rhythm that is about deceleration. It's about taking your time, about discovering everything that is around you, about paying attention, about caring, because many things that are around you and that might look silent now are actually contributions from artists that we will discover later. Um, so yeah, it's very much a, a call for understanding another way of inhabiting spaces also for us humans. And here you have the next work, which is Anastasia Sosunova. And this is, uh, we just with Heinz Frank discovered this idea of building the world differently uh, with another architecture. Here we have an artist from Lithuania who worked with what was on site. So we really wanted to work with whatever is present, namely here, a paintball. So it was, of course, extremely interesting. And you can come and discover a bit this, um, uh, the surroundings. It was very interesting for us to work with a place where humans play to shoot each other with paint. Uh, this is something that we of course found extremely uh, intriguing. And what Anastasia Sosunova did here is that she imagined that another civilization had inhabited those spaces. So the civilization is called the Drosseraspore. And the Drosseraspore were communicating by shooting, painting at each other. And what she did is that she just installed in all of these different uh, places traces or evidences of this life, this other life, this other civilization that existed before us. And what she's doing is like through science fiction and Donna Haraway is speaking beautifully about how science fiction enables us and empowers us to imagine other realities and eventually make them true. She's just putting in perspective the games we play. Why do we play uh, those fights? Why do we need to do a, put a paintball together where we become suddenly extremely wild, forget about our humanity and try to kill our best friends? Um, and really by this, like, just invokes these questions about what do we, what do we find interesting? Or what do we, are we entertained by? So here you have the Droseras Boris cult church that was uh, devoted to stray cats. And Anastasia was explaining that, um, Basically, there were huge creatures that were massive cats that were uh, basically protecting the Drosseraspore from the rain because there is no ceilings on all of, its, this, all of these different buildings. And so these huge massive cats were something that was protecting the civilization. And so to worship them, they, they, they did build this uh, church that is behind me. And maybe we can just go through it and you will discover different traces. Please follow me. 
different traces of and totemic presences because Anastasia Sosunova was very interested in the rituals that this civilization was putting together. And of course, the idea of, of Anastasia is also to uh, make us reflect like, what if humans were not the species that it is? What if another species had taken over? What kind of over life? forms and other rituals and other beliefs would exist. So here you have another house whoops, from the Drosphère Aspore. And of course, like any good civilization, the Drosphère Aspore had an interest for beverages. And you will see here at the end of this uh, paint bowl, the taverna of the Drosphère Aspore. So the myth around the Drosera Spore is still growing and Anastasia Sosunova is writing, writing many stories about them and is trying to understand them as much as she is trying through them to understand human beings. So here, please have a look at the taverna. I'm so sorry that we cannot uh, have a post together, but that's life. So here you go, with the traces of, you know, all of their many conversations, because as I was telling you, they were communicating through throwing paints at each other. And so you can tell that this taverna has been hosting many uh, very wild talks. Um, we will now enter um, a place that we call the Meadows. And uh, the Meadows basically is a moment where it's a, what, what we can call the wild garden. And uh, I invited Via Enigna, who is uh, basically the Tina Turner, or the Pope of uh, Healing Plants in, uh, in Latvia, to come here and to reclaim the whole territory of André Sala. And the idea was uh, for her to bomb seed. I don't know if you're familiar with that. The idea is that you would put lots of different seeds in clay and then throw them everywhere around, not being controlling wherever they would grow, you know, something extremely uh, spontaneous. And, uh, and she did that for several months, like since, uh, since a year. And now we can discover all around this, but also since the beginning of the territory, uh, all of these wild um, healing plants growing all around us. So they are basically reclaiming all of this territory. And the idea was to think about, okay, what could be the garden of the 21st century? We had the French garden that was about symmetry, about order. Um, you know, Louis XVI was extremely inspired. Uh, Versailles is a very interesting uh, a uh, symbol of it. We had then the romantic English garden that was about manufacturing nature. So it kind of pursues over moral values. And here they are okay. Maybe what we want today is a bit much more wildness. We want something that is celebrative, that is just growing and that we have no control upon. So you will here find like different types of eating plants. So this lavender, chamomile, sage, um, like 15 species. Uh, in total that are all around us. And as I was telling you, the idea is very much to suddenly understand like, okay, what I was basically not paying attention to is also something I can collaborate with or that I can be aware of. Speaking of which, uh, we're arriving to a place, we had to dedicate a place to that work, but it's a work that is actually moving all around and I hope that we will encounter the work, is the one of Dora Budor. So Dora Budor, wanted, you know, the whole project re-enchantment is about hearing other voices, hearing voices that we cannot hear or that we have been silencing. And she's been very interested in the crowds that are in the foreground of movies. So the crowds that are uh, incarnating fear because a tsunami is suddenly like coming uh, behind them or like a horror or, um, or something like the army, but they're always anonymous. It's always about this collective incarnation of an emotion, but something really blank. And she wanted to give more space to these crowds that are always in the background when the hero is in the foreground. And then, um, what was initially imagined was that we would have a crowd of these uh, silhouettes that would be evolving in all of this territory and kind of incarnating these like secondary humans that are usually displayed in movies and for us to think about this idea of values as well. 
But of course, in times of COVID, it's slightly complex to imagine a, a work that would gather a human crowd that would be like much less than two meters distant. So what Doha imagined was like, okay, what I'm gonna do is like, I'm gonna replace the humans by dogs. Um, dogs, because dogs have been used many times in the Eastern history and in the Soviet history to replace humans. May it be in scientific research, like in laboratories to do some yeah, experiments, maybe for uh, space, uh, research, but also in movies, like the the dogs would most of the time serve as a metaphor for the for the humans. When in the Western world, it would be more monkeys actually. And so what we have is like the stray dogs that are coming from shelters, uh, because what was super important for us also is that and for Dora is that it's not beautiful dogs. It's not uh, you know demonstrative dogs. It's dogs that are actually abandoned, that have been kind of left over, and that are that have been yeah just um, just left on the side and for them to suddenly become like the main actors uh, that would in um, inhabit this space so we might if you see a dog it might be the rabbit dog i don't know but i will tell you if we if we encounter them but yes you might think you're drunk or you might think you're extremely emotional but that's true over there it is Heinz Frank drawing that became a work and this is the first time that one of Heinz Frank's drawing actually became a, um, a physical work and here is the rhino that I was asking you to look at because it's now existing as a playground. And please have a look as well here. I find this beautiful. Now it's, it's kind of dry and it's, uh, it's going to disappear slowly. But this is also via Eninia's presence. You see how the flowers have been like breaking the concrete and how it's been. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful gardens that we can have around where all of these uh, species are kind of reclaiming their rights over here and in the same way like the work of uh, Heinz Frank is reclaiming the right to wildness and to like temperaments and attitudes and behaviors that are quite different from normative behaviors so here you have the rhino that is a kid's playground and I tried it with my daughter and it worked just fine she was very happy to enjoy it it's made for their dimensions it's made for their world and their perspective and what Heinz Frank is asking for is, or proposing, is that the kids could come up there and look at the world through this hole, as Heinz Frank believes that the hole serves as a metaphor for the beginning and the end of life. Here you have in Latvian, can the Latvian help me here? I think it means the moment of now, the site of the moment. Yeah, it's very, very hard to translate, but like I was given like several translations, but the, the, the site of the moment is one of the, um, the one that came back many times, which means like thinking about the here and now and the way we inhabit the here and now. And what he proposes is that we get uh, very inspired by the way the kids are uh, happening in the here and now. So we will go on um, leaving behind us works that are calling for a, a reflection around wildness, around like uh, letting go of attitudes, behaviors that we've been learning or thinking about them, thinking about we impose them to other species as well uh, and how eventually we can, we could thrive uh, together. And we're going to go to um, the next work, which is a work that requires a lot of work which is the one from uh, Lina Lapelite and Montas, her partner. And that is uh, something that you're gonna discover. I have to say it must be the most monumental proposition uh, of, the, of the exhibition. And this is taken from, or this is starting from a very, very old tradition in uh, the Baltic countries that is linked to timber industry. So timber industry would be about growing many, 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 many forests in the north of the Baltics and in the north of, uh, of uh, Riga Eladia. And uh, they would cut these trees, make them logs, and basically like uh, make them go throughout Europe through the Dogava. The Dogava is the river of, uh, of Riga. And here you discover it. So these are the logs that would be normally be transported. This was an ancient technique as rafts. And the Daugava was called the highway of the rafts. So you would have like absolutely immense uh, structures like this on which men, it was only men that would do this work. They would go on them 
and just float and like go with the currents uh, to get together with the with the draft like down the down the river the idea here with Lina as very often with this artist that you of course saw at the last Venice Biennial who, who got uh, with her partners uh, the golden lion the idea is always to think about the gestures choreographies movements that capitalism had imposed on our bodies and consciousnesses and so here what she wanted she wanted to build a new relationship with those logs and so these logs have arrived and you should come a bit closer to discover them they have arrived here and they have been here like now for a few weeks and so nature is kind of reclaiming it already with this uh, algae that are developing uh, all around here but most importantly you have an island in the middle that is the island of Lina La Pelite on which she will come regularly to perform and you have a sound that is a song that Lina did for this work because you know these men who were uh, uh, just leading those uh, rafts uh, through the Daugava they were singing a lot they were singing many songs about their power about how they were mastering the elements after killing all the trees they were bringing them down through the currents that they were also mastering and Lila was of course like how how can we start to invert values or how can women be brought back into a history and, and, and invert a bit this uh, uh, these uh, behaviors so here she and I hope we will hear her she sings about these rhythms about the cutting of the logs and we hear this uh, these rhythms in this song and she just explains and so sings basically a new harmony a new possibility for a new harmony um, with these uh, resources. I hope she sings. We usually have a, a pause of five minutes. It would be very unfortunate that it happened to us, this silence. But uh, this is uh, the fantastic La Fonda, who will actually be composing the music of the movie that we're gonna do. Because we're shooting the movie, we shot it one scene this morning, one two days ago, and tomorrow it's starting uh, again. And I'm so pleased that La Fonda is here to uh, to do this. So La Fonda is like listening to every sound That's around, right. I guess. Yeah. Yes. See you later. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> See you. So yes, we have many artists who are here around and, and, and um, we're incredibly happy that they could make it uh, and that we can build this project of the movie. Uh, around the show and I might tell you a few words about the movie as well uh, because the movie basically was a project that appeared uh, again around the 14th of March when we had to cancel all of our plans and uh, and we had no idea about what to expect we wanted the show to happen but we had no idea if the public could gather if we could even like go through the borders because uh, actually the borders were closed it was the total unknown and we're like what can we get out of this unknown or how can we actually make this project accessible for a wider audience that could not come here which makes so much sense as well with the project that is about resilience and about transforming the way we move the way we are transported and having thousands of people coming from all over the world would have been of course a fantastic time but not so aligned with the values that we're trying to think about so now we're going to shoot this movie with David Semenis the co-director and uh, who is a very important Latin uh, director and the, basically the, the movie will be for me like a manifesto of 2020 or the threshold of our century it's like all of the questions, uncertainties, desires, wishes, hopes of today I think they're kind of interrogated or put together in perspective by all of the artists in this show and so you will basically follow all of the Odyssey uh, that this, um, that this uh, exhibition is about with a voiceover that will kind of share uh, with you all of these questions this also humor you know there is lots of humor in our situation we should not forget it I mean we, I mean look at me uh, first and foremost <laughs> and so I think all of this is a, is a great great interrogation that we want to put in this movie and um, and La Fonda who also did uh, do the soundtrack for Laure Prouveau at the last Venice Biennial this beautiful pavilion the French pavilion and I'm not saying that because I'm French um, and uh, and I thought that it would be uh, amazing to have an artist jumping on this project uh, and doing the soundtrack because 
Latvia is so much about sound. Like every two person here is in the choir. Like singing is almost a second nature. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but in 1889 there was the Baltic Way, which was a um, chain, a human chain of 600 kilometers, where people gathered from Vilnius to Tallinn to Riga to sing a peaceful revolution that was asking for the liberation of the Baltic states. Uh, which is the only peaceful singing revolution known to humanity thus far and that will actually be reenacted on Sunday for Belarusia uh, because you might be aware of the terrible, terrible um, events that are happening right now in this region and uh, the idea was that in solidarity with uh, uh, the Belarusian uh, uh, citizens, but also with the journalists and like uh, the treatments that they are going through to reenact this uh, call for a political change. So and the exact anniversary of the Baltic Way, 23rd of August, is the anniversary of the Baltic Way. Absolutely. Way. Let me introduce you to Anastasia Blokina, the director uh, of the Biennial. And I should have started by that, by <laughs> a <fine>. massive, <laughs> massive thank you uh, to all of the Riga Biennial team. That is by far the most amazing team I've ever worked with and we all did that together. So it's like something that I want to acknowledge and uh, speak out to the world is my gratitude and the fact that you know, this, uh, this was a collective uh, moment and that nothing would have been achieved without you, without Agnia, the founder of the, of the Biennial and all the crazy team that I hope we will encounter through, through our work and I will introduce you to them as much as I can because I want to acknowledge their incredible courage and uh, and their fierce work mm -hmm. so yeah pleasure is all us <laughs> goes both ways yeah thank you so we're exchanging compliments before um entering with, with some <laughs> <laughs> before entering uh the last part but it's not the least part because uh it's uh, quite a big um, a big uh, moment in the biennial uh, basically, this is what is called uh, Osta. Maybe you might you might be able to say it. Of course, Riga Stiridnice bez Osta. That's the Riga trading port. Exactly, uh, and this building is honestly could become, I think, the national contemporary art gallery of Latvia uh, easily with some fixing, though. With some effort, <laughs> put in. But the idea was. Um, Sorry, you're here. Was really uh, you're here now? <laughs> was, was really to uh, just uh, take a space that is too big for us. You know, all of this territory is uh, is out of scale. Is out of human scale. It's a territory that we inherit that is like full of Soviet dreams, of capitalist hope, of toxic soils, to toxic uh, grounds, of like new ecosystems made by birds, by stray cats. We will speak about it a bit later. Um, and like this is a bit of uh, what Hanat Singh is speaking about, you know, how to build in the ruins of capitalism. Like how can we not hope for another world because the other world will not happen, but how do we build at the end of the world? And uh, how do we understand that the apocalypse might actually have already happened? And we are about to witness the sixth extinction um, of species because of our activities and and how do we reimagine the way we are here and now not hoping for another momentum but just understanding our place in the world and our responsibility we we're this morning with Thomas Saraceno who who made this uh, incredible balloon fly and you know this is part of his Aerosin project which is about building a new epoch and we will see the balloon a bit uh, a bit later and so we were on the bank on the banks here and uh, trying to make this balloon fly who didn't fly in the end because there was too much wind but that's also part of the projects like things might not work and this is weather dependent but this is like all in all about accepting the situation and accepting that we have to do with whatever is around us, surrounding us and about our responsibility. So the ability to respond uh, to the situation. So now uh, we're arriving in this uh, big building. You will see uh, this big building is very empty, uh, is empty because many plans could not be pursued and we had to forget about some of our fantasy and dreams and hopes 
And um, we decided to leave things as they are, not to lie, not to try to hide it. So you will discover a bit everywhere the ruins of the walls that were just teared down as everything froze in March and we had to stop uh, all of the works. And we decided to embrace this nudity. So you have this immense capella that is almost the church of the 21st century um, that is happening here. Uh, you will still see a cafe that we wanted to call the dust cafe, but we thought it's not so appealing for a cafe. Um, we were supposed to have here like glorious public program uh, projects and workshops and so on, but it's now a very big space um, that is nonetheless very inhabited. And uh, this is also the moment where I should acknowledge the beautiful work of Sofia Lemos, um, the associate curator of public programs, uh, who within 15 days transformed the whole public program into something else. Uh, because we were supposed to have every week a different speaker coming here to just enrich us with words, ideas, imagination, possibilities, narrations that would enrich uh, our understanding of here and now. And of course, this collapsed with uh, many of our plans. And what we did instead is that we launched a public program online that you can eventually uh, discover on the website. So you have, you will, will have, for example, together uh, Jack Abberstam today, later today, speaking about wildness, as I was think, talking about it uh, earlier. But we also had like Sophia Lewis discussing uh, femininity and womanhood. We had Astrid Anemainis, we had Vincent Desprez. We had many important voices that have been for since decades now thinking about alternative ways of inhabiting this world. And it was extremely important for me to acknowledge their voice and to make them heard. So I'm very thankful and I will have a glimpse of weather. Thank you very much. Mm. So now we will go um, towards the show and I will keep this water with me. So we are We are here in front of the work of Valdis Sems. Valdis Sems is a cinetic artist uh, who has actually imagined this work uh, in the 70s, but Valdis Sems never got the tools or the means or the financial possibility to produce his work. So we are extremely happy uh, that this was materialized and that we could um, basically help for the production of this. Valdis Sams is an artist, has a, any cinetic artist who's always been interested in the question of light, motions and energies. And this is a, a piece about rhythms. What Valdis Sams is this, uh, the, the red part is basically about uh, the power of the fire, when the uh, green part is about the power of the earth. And for him it's like life is a permanent encounter between all of these forces. Also like what you see for the raster is different types of elements. Um, that are in permanent motion and which means that they are like permanently uh, encountering each other in different ways and that's what uh, Davaldi says about life basically life is about permanent motions and permanent encounters and permanent transformation so here we basically enter a room and uh, a section of the show that is about relationships uh, in the their widest sense and here you are in a place that was supposed to be a gigantic white uh, room that would have been painted from head to toes. Uh, and as you see, <laughs> plans have changed. Uh, because this was supposed to be a Pavel Altamer uh, draftsman congress in which people were invited together and we would have like pencils, brushes, everything so they could paint as much as they want, like write things, um, poetry, drawings, and, and really have this for, for Pavel Altamer is really about putting democracy together, just allowing a kind of exquisite body of a mental collective landscape to happen on these walls and on this floor. And of course, um, a few months ago, it happened to be uh, quite unrealistic to imagine that thousands of people could gather here and paint uh, all together. So what Pavel proposed instead was to launch uh, an open call or proposition through one drawing that he made and proposed that people would start to just react to it and build this uh, um, exquisite body, exquisite corpse, uh, 
one drawing after one drawing. So we're enriching every day those and you have um, the drawing uh, by Pavel that is here in the middle, which is the spiral whirlpool that you can see. Uh, and that is a motif that we will find again throughout the show in other works, actually. And this is uh, this whirlpool that relates pretty well uh, to our moment, our floating moment, where we don't know really where the world stands. And we all feel, of course, that we are at a threshold. Here we will go towards the next work, which is Nina Bayer. So Nina Bayer wanted to make a a gesture of peace towards the stray cats that are inhabiting this territory. When we came to visit the space, we encountered many of them. And what she wanted was to really basically do a gesture of peace and welcoming. So here you have, but she also wants to, by this way, interrogate the question of domestication. Um, and, and here she took this um, lion's so these lions are basically decorative lions that one will use uh, to decorate one garden, you know, to express, of course, the ferocious uh, uh, fierceness of the lions, but also like the domestication of it because it's now standing as a decorative object in your beautiful house. Uh, but every day we have pregnant women that are coming to fill uh, the negative space of these lions with milk. So the milk is over there in the fridge. Um, and this is a gesture of hospitality, but also of yeah, welcoming. We will also have a time performances that will happen just uh, outside of the space where we will have Range Rovers parked. And basically the pregnant women will come here, just offer this, um, uh, this uh, milk to the cats, so kind of trying to enter into a relationship with them. And then we'll go into the Range Rover that they will use as pavilions of sort. Why is that interesting for Nina Bayer? Because Range Rovers are, uh, have been marketed as a car that is bringing you close to the wild, like very close to nature, yet it's one of the most polluting car on earth. So that is basically killing what it wants to touch. And she's very much through this work interrogating like these paradoxes or this problem when you really want to get something, but what kind of um, counter action you can create through this gesture. Um, and this is yeah, very much what she, what she was uh, interested about. She also spoke about this work saying that we are in a society that wants to milk out everything. So basically take the best of everything. And she's wondering why we humans are unable to do things without thinking about what we get, what we can get out of this gesture, out of this action. And so it's always like very much, yeah, interrogating the question of hospitality, of encountering, of building relationship for what aim and, and to what, for what consequences. Here you have another work by uh, Catherine Arnek, an Austrian artist that's called A Landmass to Come. So this is made of the clay that is to be found in the Baltic state and in, in, like, close to Riga. So clay has like billions and billions of years of existence. We think, or we might think that uh, life started from clay actually, but it's been used by humans in very different ways and also for manufacturers, industries and so on. And what Catherine Arnick wants to interrogate is the way we are metamorphosing, transforming this material and what we're doing with it and what kind of relationship we have uh, with this, which is basically the land we are uh, dependent on. And for that, she invited teenagers. So teenagers are also humans that are in a state of metamorphosis. They are not any more kids. They are not really yet adults. They are going through changes that they might not really master. I don't know if you, some of you have um, teenagers at home, but I'm sure you know what I mean. And they were invited here to basically listen to this meditation that uh, Catherine Arnick did built about uh, clay and that you can hear over there. Uh, in these headphones and the teenagers have been here inhabiting this space and basically reflecting and uh, drawing and transforming this material as they were listening uh, to this piece. So this is very much a reflection of the relationship we can build with the ground uh, and uh, whatever we're working on. And we're going to go towards another project that this time is really thinking about what kind of relationship you can build with the air. Uh, so it's really from the ground to earth. And this is for me one of the most beautiful performance of the 20th century. Uh, and I will speak here before you can uh, have a look at the movie. Uh, and this is the work of Philippe Petit. So Philippe Petit is not an artist per se, but I think he did one of the biggest performances again. Uh, in 1974, he managed to uh, have a wire that was uh, built between the two twin towers and did manage to walk like 450 meters high between these twi the, the twin 
the Twin Towers, sorry, uh, for 20 minutes. So he basically realized the coup that he had prepared for more than six years since he was 18 uh, and that he saw a postcard of the Twin Towers. He was dreaming of, uh, of walking be uh, between them. For me, this work is speaking so much about modernity, about the time where we were fixing, you know, the cities and making them very rational, very organized. And yet you have a very fragile human body, absolutely not protected, that start to use it as a playground and that starts to transform it completely into a moment of challenge, of magic um, and, and of total transformation. So here you have, okay, we were supposed to have something amazing, which were all of the objects belonging to this performance. Everything he used to prepare it, uh, from his uh, uh, a costume to lure the guards uh, at the beginning of and, and the entrance of the Twin Towers, to the shoes he used, to the rope uh, that, were used, that was used to do the performance. But we could not ship all of these works are, as everything was stopped. So now we have pictures uh, of these works um, and of the of the different objects that he used and we are also showing the movie Man on Wire where he's explaining how he prepared like the biggest coup of uh, the 20th century. So here you can discover different uh, archives and documents where they're basically um, trying to do all the measurements and preparation for the size of the rope, for the tension that needs to be put together. So it's all of these notes, all of this different uh, understanding of the Twin Towers like that was just being built at the time. So understanding the plans of the architects and how they could sneak in because all of this was illegal, of course. So here you see that he just um, disguised himself as a worker to go up there and to just study basically the architecture and to see how he could manage uh, to do this coup. And over here you have the police reports because of course he got arrested many times. Um, and yeah, so here is the boat that he used to throw uh, the, the wire into the other twin tower. So like one of his colleagues would just get it and like put it together. And here you have him basically walking in between the two twin towers, uh, 400. Uh, 450 meters high. Nothing. Out of frustration, I take all my clothes off, and I think that the line, I would feel that the line on my naked uh, skin. So here we have um, uh, what I was telling you about, the balloon that we made fly uh, this morning or that we attempted to make fly with, uh, uh, with Thomas Saraceno. So this balloon is part of the Aerosin project. The Aerosin project is about uh, putting together a new epoch in which we are building relationships that are in harmony uh, with the natural resources of the world. So with the wind, with the sun, and that also is calling for a better understanding of whatever energies are already in place and that we could work with instead of using energy that are made out of fossil fuels. So this is a balloon that you can take in this backpack and like anyone can come in the show and uh, use it. I mean, you need a bit of training after what I saw this morning with uh, Thomas, but um, eventually everyone can be using it. And the idea is to reclaim the sky. For Thomas Saraceno, the earth and the sky particularly has been taken away uh, from the citizens by different companies, by different private interests. And this is a space that belongs to us and that we have to reclaim because like the air is now full of pollution, full of 2.5 particles. Um, and we have to basically understand that this space, the ocean of air that we all breathe in is absolutely vital for our survival, but also to other species survival. So now we're gonna go to actually the third work of Thomas Saraceno. You will discover another one, but this was the surprise work because Thomas was for weeks and months asking me like, Rebecca, Rebecca, can you find please like a spider web in this venue? I was like, yeah, I saw a few, but honestly, they're not like really accessible. They're not like really interesting, although this is a problematic term, but I was like, you know, Thomas, I'm not sure that we will manage to really find the spider web that you're looking for. And during the installment last week, the elevator broke. 
which you can imagine was an immense problem, but this is something that usually happens when you're super, super late and that you have to rush and finish your installment and of course the elevator breaks. And I was walking just past here as the people were trying to repair the elevator. And suddenly I stop and I was like, what? And come with me, you will discover what actually was surrounding the people who were fixing the elevator in the engine room was this absolutely stunning spider web that has been weaved for years and that basically wearing all of the dust, you know, like layers and layers of history and of dust that is being here encapsulated just basically hold together and this looks like a, I don't know, a Gaudi architecture or like a, the, the, the embroidery of a beautiful dress, absolutely stunning. And so now we have uh, basically this, uh, this spider web that is here and that was basically uh, vibrating as much as the elevator would move. That, that, was, that was very interesting to see that the spider web was attuned to our activities anyway and it moves at times when, uh, when we, uh, we move the elevator. So this is the second surprise work by Thomas Saraceno and the spider web, of course. We're now going to the first floor. And the first floor uh, starts with a work by Pierre Huyghe. It's called The Extinction, and uh, it's a, a, a work that is a video that dives into an ember stone, a very small ember stone, yet you discover in it an incredible micro, microcosm that is putting together like a whole array of life. And the idea is that time has been stopped and encapsulated within uh, that amber stone. You might know that amber is extremely important in the region of the Baltics as well. It's like a very, very important stone that is very much worshipped as well. And here the idea is that we could possibly de-extinct the species and beings that have been encapsulated in this silent stone. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to not be spending more time with each work and I have to kind of give you a, just a small teasing, fast uh, sneak peek into them, but I wish uh, you could spend more time with them and that's why also that the movie will be there uh, so we can really take a bit more time. Uh, here we are in the uh, proposition of Oliver Bier. You have again like a, a big room that is filled with ghosts, uh, that are ghosts of the works that were supposed to be shown. They are called uh, household gods. And basically they are uh, vessels, objects that belong to his family. So you have one that was his mother, his grandmother, and his sister over there. And the piece is about having different objects that belong to them and how to make them sing. Because basically Oliver has discovered that anything around us, I mean, he hasn't discovered it, but he's using the fact that everything around us has a frequency. And as long as you're willing to give it a voice to make it resonate, you will hear that it's a sound. And what you hear now around us in this room is the sound of those objects that could not be brought together that are actually being put in a conversation um, with Aspasia. So for Oliver, it was extremely important that his family uh, would enter a dialogue with someone from Latvia. And here you have Aspasia, who is like one of the main figures of literature and theater uh, from the late 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Aspasia was a someone that was extremely dedicated to feminism and to the question of liberation of uh, Latvia and for whom it was extremely important to imagine that only an inclusive society where women could thrive and where the woman voice would be heard uh, could be imaginable. And so here you have objects that belong to Aspasia that are here and uh, the idea is that we can listen to their resonance that is dialoguing with the, uh, the family of, um, of Oliver. 
Also, we have here, we had absolutely stunning performances uh, with a choir from, uh, from Riga that came here and that got also attuned with this object by singing uh, frequencies of their favorite lullabies. So it was a moment where like everyone's intimacy was kind of resonating together in a moment of harmony. Um, this is something that will happen again because as I was telling you, singing is basically a, a second nature of every uh, person in the, in Latvia and this is something that of course was very important for us to embrace, uh, the power of the voice. So you see that we now we are in a section that is very much thinking about our understanding of death, our understanding of silence, of disappearance, and, and kind of putting it into perspective, you know. Um, Vincent Desprez like, uh, wrote a beautiful book about this question of uh, uh, dead people and thinking that actually people are not really dead since the livings are making them alive by worshipping them, by thinking of them, by uh, just uh, uh, making rituals for them. And this is something that uh, uh, here, Dominika Ozovi, a Polish artist, is very much interested in. She's always been interested in the way and always been suspicious about the way uh, we treat uh, death in our culture and in our society and why we're trying at every cost to hide death, uh, to fight against death, to fight against decay, to kind of master time uh, this way. And here we were supposed to have the house, I mean the bedroom of uh, Velumate. Velumate is the goddess of death. Uh, in Latvia. Uh, so we could not have the work presented. So what instead we did is that it's presented as I speak at the Raster Gallery in Warsaw in Poland and I very much um, invite you to go there and visit the, the project if you are somewhere around. Um, but what was produced here is this incredible stained glass um, that is about this question of uh, how ghosts can come to visit us eventually. And here you have this cup of coffee that is basically spreading this smell, that is reaching out this nose. It makes me think about COVID test a lot when I see this. Um, and then you have this ghost that is leaking out of this nose as much as like a ghost that is basically suddenly like coming for your memory and attacking yourself and your consciousness because of its coming back. And we have regularly here uh, a performer uh, that comes and that is a professional weeper. And what is quite interesting or what was very interesting for Dominica is the fact that we have in many different cultures created this figure of the weeper who is like someone professional that you will hire to scream and to express extremely visibly the sorrow that you're going through because of the loss of someone you love. And this is very interesting how we have the, 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 the possibility or the interest to transfer like the incarnation of this emotion which is also questioning of course how much space we give to the effects and how much space we give to emotions uh, nowadays and so this professional weeper comes here and sits there and looks at the work and cries just cries and cries and cries here we have another fluid work, if I might do a beautiful transition, um, that is the one of Eva Lust. Eva Lust has been uh, spending lots of time in, uh, in Riga and was very interested by uh, uh, the Dogava, so the river of, uh, of Riga, and how, uh, because of different man-made interventions, like on the river itself, with different jetties that have been built, and I mean, Andre Sala, the territory we're working on today together, uh, is basically completely man-made. It has been, it started as a, as a dam that has started to basically jetties that have been building islands um, because they wanted to basically stop the floods from uh, from uh, Riga um, and then it started to build like islands so the uh, islands of André which is André Sala started to appear and then like it grew and grew and it became a peninsula and then like eventually it expanded and became a part of Riga so all of this what we're working on uh, right now is man-made and this type of intervention had lots of different consequences and one of them is like that a church uh, got completely flooded uh, and is now lying uh, in the um in the in the Dogava, and what uh, what uh, Eva is interested in with this movie uh, is basically uh, uh, something that happens really in the exotic sea oceans. Is that there is a, a disease that is called the calenture that is very well known, and that is uh, an illusion that could attack the sailors over there. It's like basically a psychological illusion where the sailors have been seeing grass instead of the ocean, and they would suddenly believe 
really, that the, 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 they would have fields of grass in front of them and they would jump in the water and die. So this was a real problem that was like a, a, a real problem to solve for the, the sailors when they would go through these uh, oceans. And what she did, Eva was thinking about this, as when people would jump over this uh, boat, it would not be like the idea of going towards death, but going towards another life, another world. And this is what you're discovering in her movie, is basically her going underwater and imagining what this other world, once you have jumped from your boat, what this other world could eventually look like. Speaking about transforming the world or an understanding like different ways and different uh, architecture it could take. Uh, here we have the work by Isham Berada. Isham Berada was interested in the materiality of the city. Basically he's, he's, he's an alchemist, he's a, a magician almost who is able to accelerate and decelerate time as much as he wants through the manipulation of chemical elements. And what he was explaining to us is like any city in the world is a geological aberration on the scale of, of geology. So we basically, thanks to all of the buildings that we are putting together, transforming the geology of one's place and building together something that would eventually look like this in a million of years. So what he's done is like he's been accelerating the decay uh, of the of the of the elements, namely like calcium, for example, that would uh, calcare that would like transform, and this is what Riga might look like in a million of years. So here we are in a section where artists and, and creators are very much interested in the hidden architectures of the world and like understanding, you know, different dimensions, different trajectories. And this is the work of Dina Taimina. Dina Taimina is again a creator, so someone who is not an artist or an academically trained artist. She's a mathematician and she's been interested in, in hyperbolic spaces. So hyperbolic spaces I'm not a mathematician, but uh, the idea is that we cannot understand or build the space uh, in terms of lines, but rather in terms of curves and understand that it's not about symmetry, it's not about perfect like classical idea of a perspective, but the world in contrary is just like these objects, it's like permanently like curving on each other, transforming, mutating and so on. So this is a revolutionary, of, uh, revolutionary way of understanding the world that she's basically expressing. And what she she wanted to do is to empower many people with this crochet. So all of this that you see has been done with this technique, that is the crochet. And that is a technique that is usually a technique for women, you know, like in domestic spaces, very hidden. And this way she's been basically uh, calling people, so here it's more than 700 people who responded to the open call and who started to weave together these works. Here you have a crochet that is made out of the bed sheet of uh, in prison made by women. You have other ones that have been made uh, in tapes that have like voices recorded on them. And the idea really is that basically all of these people weaving this crochet were basically weaving a, a revolutionary idea of the world. This is also a way to challenge uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, an access to the, 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 the understanding of whatever surrounds us and whatever the world is made of. This is also something that was extremely important, for example, for the Cubist. The Cubist movement was revolutionized by this because then suddenly we didn't have to work in terms of perspective. We could just imagine that the world could be like a, an expanded 4D um, moment instead of, of just uh, uh, faces and volumes and, and uh, 3D. Uh, that we know. So we see that all of this, of course, all of this uh, non-Euclidean geometry has had immense impact uh, on art um, amongst other realms. So here we should have had uh, a work by Thomas Saraceno and the idea was uh, that we would have had one of his spider webs uh, that would have been brought and uh, this uh, room would have been completely obscured uh, but this was not possible, we could not ship the work, so instead we were proposing these posters. These posters are part of his project that he launched at the Palette Tokyo when we did the show together in 2018, but that he really uh, developed for the Venice Biennial, the last Venice Biennial, you might have seen that. So this is called Arachnomancy. Basically, um, and of course the visitors are very welcome to take them, his idea is that uh, we could eventually see the spider webs as oracles because spider webs are able to uh, transmit, capture, record phenomena that we have absolutely no access to as humans because of our 
our senses, quite simply. So his theory is that, for example, spiders might be able to feel gravitational waves that are when two uh, black holes collide. And you know, they do like incredible resonances and, and uh, vibrations that go through the universe and that eventually go through the Earth. The only uh, first time we were able to uh, record one was in 2015. But what Thomas Saraceno thinks is like basically spiders are able to feel these phenomena that are much, much bigger than us and that we have no access to. So what he wants is that through this, that is um, developed uh, through an app that anyone can download, which is the uh, Arachnomancy app, uh, you can basically record any uh, spider web that you will see and ask the application to give you an oracle or respond to your question. This is, of course, a gesture for Thomas to uh, fight against extinction, against the massacre that we have done in the Western world uh, against spiders, because we have decided that they were not worthy of being in our interiors, that they were not worthy of our love. Uh, when actually, for example, in Latvia, I know that like a, a spider, the presence of a spider is good luck. Uh, it's the same in Madagascar. If you have a spider uh, in, your, in your room, in your house, you will never touch it because this means that you will be wealthy, happy, incredibly successful, uh, sexy, and so on, and you name it. So this means that basically um, the way we are loving these species is, is in the, the culture we have towards them is defining whether we will give them the right to breathe, the right to be able, uh, alive or not. And this is what Thomas wants to arise as well as a type of consciousness. Now we are going to go towards uh, another proposition that is about these other ways of an understanding the world that are going through other spectrums than the human spectrum. And it looks a bit like a spider web when you're far away. So this is a work by Eva Krisch, which are choreographers uh, and dancers. And they were very interested in the, the choreography of an object that is not human. Uh, and that is the Puzuris. The Puzuris is an object that is very present um, in the Lithuanian and uh, uh, Latvian cultures and that is basically usually uh, made out of uh, hay and that is something that you, you would use in moments that are very important in your life. So moments of the wedding, moments of the uh, child or a tra big transformation. It's basically something that is made to protect you, to somehow like hold things together and to be there and you know, reacting to all of the energies that you cannot see. So it might be the wind, it might be our energy, us, the group of humans that just came in. And the way it moves and so on can be just like protecting you from whatever you cannot see. And so what they will do is that they will come uh, at different uh, moments of the biennial to dance uh, with, uh, with the movement of the Puzuris and with this uh, protector that is supposed to feel and sense things uh, that are all, again, like things that we cannot reach and that we have no access to. We are now going to go to the next work, which is the work of Agnese Krivade, who is uh, an artist from Riga. We will not be able to go in because this is a secret work where one is not allowed to speak. Or maybe you will go with the camera and I will stay here. But basically the work of uh, Agnese is about bringing together um, a space that is a space of meditation. Uh, a space where you're invited to meet yourself, so only one or two people are allowed to go in and you're not uh, allowed to speak. What you will see inside uh, is a, a picture of Saint Christopher, the saint with the dog face. This is the oldest uh, representation of Saint Christopher that we know that you will see inside. And basically Saint Christopher for uh, Agnes Crivade is a very interesting figure because it's a saint that has been worshipped for centuries and centuries and centuries until the church decided that it was not possible that the saint would have a dog face. So they removed him from the sanctity and he was removed from like this uh, holy place. But what for uh, Agnes is completely crazy is that this, this um, uh, saint actually saved so many lives from like people here that were worshiping, worshiping it. So she was interested in this uh, paradoxes of fake healing, of the moment where you're basic, basically because of what you believe in, because of what you trust in, you will be transformed, you will be healed, you will be mutating. And this place is very much a, a place that calls for that. And that is a place where you can witness from the top a performance that is happening below where we entered in the building. And we're oh going to go now to the next work that is by Egle Budvitite. So Egle Budvitite uh, was interested in the writings of Octavia Butler, but also Lynn Margulis that are thinking about 
uh, the human beings as a humus, uh, but also like the whole earth being surrounded by humus. And the humus is basically all of this material that is made of, out of the decay of life that is enabling another life to thrive. And so um, this was shot in uh, Lithuania this movie uh, and is basically featuring these dancers with like songs that you cannot hear now unfortunately because it's on headset and phones um, but there are songs about this question of uh, relationship and entanglements between um, these, uh, these uh, beings and the earth. Uh, the idea is very much that what we are, our materiality as human beings, uh, will potentially enable other beings to, to, uh, to thrive and to, um, and to live and this is like a call for uh, understanding and awareness from, uh, from uh, Egli. Another artist who performed here yesterday and uh, who's an amazing artist, who's a saxophonist actually, a musician, is uh, Bendy Giske. And Bendy Giske is um, someone who is building all of his uh, work on breathing. This work here is basically a, a, a video of a work that we were supposed to produce uh, and show here, but we produced it in Berlin where it is now and he just shot himself in it. But it's basically uh, he's, uh, doing music following the technique of uh, circulatory breathing, which means that it will take a huge breath of air and this breath we will use and reuse and reuse and kind of exhaust until it cannot breathe anymore. The idea is to basically interrogate or like make the best of these resources that we take for granted. Obviously, latest events like with the, the death of George Floyd showed us that some of us are granted the right to breathe while others are not. And this is something that is, um, is of course, resonating a lot with the research of, uh, of um, Bendik that is about like what do we do with the breath and understanding that the breath is almost a political momentum and it's almost a political gesture that we are doing, which calls us all for like the reflection of Thomas Saraceno when he's telling us rep reclaim the earth, reclaim the sky just be aware of the fact that this ocean of air around us is not something that is granted and that many many different companies or actors are just taking away from us and that that's, that has like a direct direct consequences so this is a basically a, a, a beautiful song that is about this moment of what do you do with what we have and what do you do with what you what is like the most precious thing which is breathing and how suddenly you can transform any situation into like an incredible moment of transformation so this idea of transformation of uh, using the, the moment and what we take for granted in a different way is also echoed in the work of Janusz Sama, an artist from Estonia who's been uh, working on um, cruising spaces. So cruising spaces, for those who might not know what it is, is basically a practice of going to public spaces and encountering uh, total strangers. These encounters might be just about talking, might be just about looking at each other, or might end up in sexual relationships. But it's basically about using spaces that everyone knows and that everyone like um, eventually goes to, such as like public parks, such as the opera, such as here in the beaches of Jormala, for example, or the market, and actually go there to just um, try to perform other types of encounters. So what you see here has been built like um, the fairs, the tourist fairs that were happening in the Soviet times and that uh, uh, Janusz took the architecture from and he did put together all of these archives um, that he found of cruising spaces that were very famous during Soviet times because Riga was a bit the Berlin um, of the of the Soviet, uh, of the Soviet uh, Union and, and people would come and this was very well known that you could come there and have these encounters. So this is basically just making us rethink a bit about uh, this place that, that we think we know, that are very public, that are almost monuments uh, to the city and to its patrimony and that can be kind of hacked or that can be used and transformed in their nature and in their use by some individuals who actually perform actions of love uh, most of the time, a love that might not be a lasting love, but some kind of uh, uh, attraction at least. Here we arrive in the work of Alex Bashinsky Jenkins, who in the same way has been thinking about space, uh, the political nature of space, but also its political nature. And he's been thinking about the question of safe space. So this video is basically making you a uh, fellow a community, a queer community, although I'm not a fan of this um, 
of this uh, name. So let's say a community that is like non-gender conforming, that just don't want to be normative, that want to be uh, following whatever feelings, uh, gender identities that they are uh, interested in and that are not normal or that are not standardized and uh, is following uh, their lives, but also the way they are being endangered and, and threatened permanently by uh, very reactionary conservative forces uh, in Poland. So you see now an extract where uh, they are demonstrating uh, for their rights and where they are extremely, extremely violently uh, aggressed by uh, other communities. So of course this movie is about the freedom to and the possibility for one to claim uh, a fluidity in its identity and uh, the idea that we don't have to you know, operate following a certain program that would assign a certain role to women, men, um, young, slim, big, uh, whatever bodies. And this um, next work is uh, also thinking about this question. This work is uh, from Berenice Olmedo, a Mexican artist, um, and is uh, basically made of prostheses, kids' prostheses, that have been going through uh, diseases. And what you see here is the choreography of them trying to... So we are now maintaining the show, so you might hear sounds that are not part of the work. Um, but basically these are performing like these prostheses that are trying to stand up, that are trying to pr pr perform this moment of like managing to walking because like that's the way we understand like the human body to be able to work, to perform. We imagine that it can only be that way. And uh, Berenice wants to basically put in perspective the idea that the, a default body, that a body that is abnormal, that is a body that is not made to walk or stand or, or, or run, can be a body that we also accept. Um, you have the metal of this prosthesis that is also a huge contrast with the funny, very childish drawings that are appearing on them and this universe of innocence and, uh, and naivety that is uh, yeah, just like confronted with this, uh, the extreme brutality of this, uh, of this object and um, what, they, what they stand for. But there are prostheses for um, prosthesis for uh, the body, and here we have an artist, Sarah Hortmeyer, who thinks about the prosthesis of the language. Basically, in this uh, work that is called Diabolus Mondial, you discover uh, works that are uh, taken away, uh, taken from the emoji vocabulary. So the emojis are basically the little figures you can uh, exchange with on your iPhones. And this basically is a new universal uh, vocabulary. And what Sarah Hortmeyer is really fascinated by is the fact that this vocabulary, this language, has been enabling us to exchange emotions that we are unable to perform otherwise. I don't know about you, but for example, I put hearts and quite cheesy uh, emojis is very regularly in my uh, uh, text right now but of course I would never say I love you instead of a heart to the people I'm sending these arts to so it's very much about how this language has enabled a whole series of affects and emotions to be expressed when our language the words that we can use are almost failing to operate this way so this is basically the different figures that are calling back or like just raising an awareness on these processes of the language that are basically the emojis of the devils that are now being spread a bit everywhere in this, um, in this room. And now we're gonna go towards the last floor, so the third floor, uh, and discover the next work. And here, this is a moment that I will use to actually uh, let you listen to this proposition by Felicia Atkinson, a proposition called Love for Anna. And here we're entering a section that is dedicated to love, to care, to affection, and the way we can display this. And this uh, composition was supposed to be a big installation on which one was uh, invited to just like sit or just lie down and listen. And we would have uh, 
have the installation surrounded by different um, patterns imagined by uh, Anna, which is the person that Felicia Atkinson is dedicating this piece to. And Anna is Anna Apinis, who was a woman who was uh, doing amazing patterns. She was a textile artist from Riga who got uh, sent to the camps uh, in Germany and who still went on uh, producing these patterns that were very much about invisible patterns of the world and of the cosmos. And so Felicia was extremely touched by the work and the researches of this textile artist and wanted to pay an homage, a tribute to the work um, that this, uh, this uh, woman maintained throughout um, the most uh, extreme experiences. So here, speaking of care, speaking of attention, we have a, a work by Edith Dekin that's called Visitation Zone. And as you might see, we have here someone that is visiting this space and that is inhabiting it in a very special way. She is basically walking on layers of dust that are the dust of this building that has been a, um, gathered like throughout the installment that is now basically a kind of carpet she would walk on like the kind of dust the, the layers of history that have been like put together here and on them you have these aquariums these aquariums have been taken away from the zoo uh, of Riga and you see here the traces of life uh, that they used to encapsulate and this really big paradoxes of aquariums and any zoo of sorts which are about the idea of conserving lives while completely unjailing it so here you see Basically for the artist it's very important that you see all of the traces of what happened or that you can basically project what happened in here. And meanwhile, we have uh, uh, this uh, beautiful person, this uh, almost ghostly person that here takes care about, uh, takes care of this garlic. Um, this garlic that is uh, of course something that is known to uh, de-infect, to kind of uh, transform like the the taste, but is also something that is believed to be a, a, a protector against vampires. So it's uh, something that is very interesting for uh, Edith, is the power of things, or the power we give to things. And here we have a, a gesture of care and a gesture of attention that is made towards these um, garlic pieces that are being transported from one place to another. We're gonna go on. Oh, I was telling you about the disappearance of many dreams and wishes. There were many walls in the dream uh, and the wishes that we had for the exhibition. And so here on the floor, you will see a bit everywhere. I mean, since the beginning of the show, the traces of the walls that were supposed to be built in the exhibition. Now, basically, we wanted to acknowledge, and that might make you make you think of the of the movie Dogville, for example, of where the actors are just uh, comedians are just playing in. in invisible uh, territories that are just like basically white lines on the on the floor and this was a way for us to acknowledge um, you know the traces of what disappeared and what was supposed to be so the the visitors as well can imagine and and go through the experience we also went through which is like a moment floating between past dreams and, and current reality so uh, speaking of which, past dreams and current reality, we have the work of Augusta Serapinas, a Lithuanian artist. Um, we went through quite some um, unexpected adventures with this work because the project of to uh, Augustas was initially to gather snowmen during the winter in Riga. So we had basically built together a brigade of different young people who were ready to go in the city of Riga, waiting secretly, hidden, for the families to gently build together snowmen with their kids. And then we would have come taken the snowmen away for a few hours, completely copied them in wood or like different materials, and then brought back the snowmen where we stole them. And what we wanted to do was to exhibit a big gallery of the snowmen that would have done last winter in Riga. This idea was really to acknowledge this moment of extreme freedom, extreme poetry, extreme collaboration between humans and whatever falls from the sky, namely the, the snow. But what happened is that there was an historical uh, warm winter this year. Uh, so historical that many scientists like wrote essays about the gravity of the situation and the way it would like arm ecosystems in a very, very deep way. So what happened is that in February, we understood that we were completely screwed and that what this exhibition is talking about, which is like the end of a world and the beginning of a new one, which is the one that we are in actually, 
well, it was happening in front of us. And uh, for Augusta, it was like, okay, basically the rituals and the link we had with snow is now disappearing in front of our, of our own eyes. What kind of rituals could replace that? And so it was imagining that, well, then what we could do is like eventually use hay or use mud. And this is what you see. This is basically kids that have been called and we did workshop with kids to imagine what like the new snowman that there, the now that there is no snow could look like. So this is basically almost like ghosts of sorts, a uh, ghost of past dreams that are no longer possible uh, because these resources that we were almost certain to have, you know, I feel a bit stupid now, but we even thought that, yeah, of course it will snow. Um, and actually it didn't happen. So we had to rethink completely the way one could express its imagination um, when, when the snow has disappeared. So this is basically a, a, a gallery of uh, love portraits to the ghost of the, of the snowman. And here you have another type of love, a love that is uh, written by Erika Eiffel. Erika Eiffel is uh, not an artist or uh, not someone that is claiming uh, her presence as such. Uh, she's someone who created OS International, which is a movement that is claiming the right to love objects rather than humans. So what you discover here is parts of the lovers of Erika Eiffel. Basically, she's saying that she has no attractions for humans and that she is much more interested in objects, that she can build like much stronger relationships with them. So what you can see here is basically a reproduction because she's usually falling in love with objects that are much bigger than what a human love can achieve, which is namely a crane or over there the Eiffel Tower. But she also had adventures or like relationships with uh, the Berlin Mauer or with a guillotine, with objects she says that are very complex for humanity to deal with and that are usually despised or that are not so loved. And what was very interesting is like when we were talking, I was very, I wanted to invite Erika because of course at first you're like, oh, funny, I mean, completely cuckoo this story with like humans falling in love and having relationship with objects. What is that story about? But I was talking with her and she was like, you know, Rebecca, if I, if every human would care as much as I do for every object that is surrounding us, the world would definitely be a better place or a different place. We would not have so much waste. We would like not have so much production because you would care about whatever surrounds you and you would not just like throw it away as you go. So this is basically a kind of a manifesto. Also, she was calling my attention towards something. She was like, there are like three domains in life where a love for an object is accepted. It's sports, music, and art, where humans are actually welcome to have very strong relationship with an object that they could love and worship and claim a very specific attention to. So speaking about attention and speaking about care, we are now going to see the work of Mikhail Karikis and Uriel Orlo. It's an older work, but that I've been always extremely touched by, which is a work that they did with uh, miners so miners in Belgium, a uh, former uh, um, choir that they, they, with whom they worked and this choir basically you will discover them in a, in a few minutes. Like we all know that uh, the work of a miner must be amongst the most terrible or most hard work you can do. You're completely cut from, the, 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 from life. You're in this space that is completely dark, extremely humid, extremely cold. You work in very dangerous conditions, like the numbers of miners that have, that have died and these conditions are absolutely enormous. Yet, these uh, miners developed an incredible tenderness and care and attention towards everything they were going through in these mines. And this choir that you can hear on this uh, headphone uh, is basically a choir that is singing the most minimal noises and presences that they were encountering every day. So they will sing every drop that was falling. They will sing every single bit of wind that was going through. They will win the stones that they were walking on. And it's basically a, a, a love song uh, to this moment, into this environment that was like extremely hostile, but yet that they paid so much care and so much attention to and that they spent all, all of their life and existence uh, with. So the mining industry, as you all know, has been uh, very prolific to produce 
uh, a lot. And here we are in the next room that is asking about what do we produce and what are we expecting from um, machines, for example, that we are producing. And this is a work by Christophe Ensens, who's a, a Latvian artist, who's um, asking, the title is, what do I dream about? And basically he's been here building machines that are expanding and that are moving, like basically expressing their own dreams. The idea is to not have machines that would be following our own desires as humans to see them performing whatever task we give them, but rather the contrary, to imagine that imagine, uh, machines can also have affects, that they can also have some dreams. So this one is desperately trying to reach the horizon. Over there, we have a, a machine that is uh, also playing with a, a miniature toy um, of, it, of itself, but that is riding this horse uh, and trying to basically put itself in another position. Over here, we have also a miniature toy uh, of, the, of the machine that is having this fight with this dinosaur. And so this is very much a moment where we are calling for another imaginary, where the machine suddenly like becomes something else and have, uh, have the possibility of having affects or have a possibility of like entering in a transformative moment. And this is um, what happens in the next work. Hello, Valdis. So Valdis, the artist is here, Valdis Sams who I was telling you about. Well, the Sams is the first work that we saw in this building, the work, uh, cinetic work about the uh, rhythms. And um, Valdis doesn't speak Latvian, so I don't know if, uh, the, so of course he speaks Latvian, he doesn't speak English. Is there a Latvian person who could uh, ask uh, Valdis to say a word here? Yeah, you want? Can you ask Valdis if he, if he wants to just tell us a word about the positron? We are filming now, Valdis, and uh, I wanted to know if you could say a few words about the positron and maybe you could translate. I will try. No, the idea is that the first thing is the first thing is the first so the idea came from the last century, uh, in the middle of the 70s. Ja, da bi iecere veidot pie viens elektronikas rūpnīcas Ukrainā lielu ārtelpas objektu. Uh, there was a uh, large in, uh, industrial um, uh, factory in the Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, Ivan Frankovska. Yeah, of Ivan Frankovska. Ja, es pats no formulēju ideju. So he um, uh, formulated the idea himself. Un maketu, un šo ideju and he uh, formed the, the uh, draft uh, project and that idea was accepted. Yeah. But tajos laikos bieži notika tā, ka gan finansiālu, gan ekonomisku, gan birokratisku iemeslu dēļ projekti apstājās. So as it was uh, common in those times, uh, the project, because of finances or politics, uh, uh, the project was abandoned. Mm. Yeah. But man ir ielikta ideja, kurai ir gan psihologiska iedarbības cilvēku, ir utilitārs līmenis, bet ir arī garīgais līmenis. So this uh, project had a, uh, a level of um, spirituality as well as uh, practicalism. Yeah, kā mākslas darbam es esmu viņam veltījis vēl daudzus variantus. As a piece of art, he has uh, devoted um, veltīts ve kā, kādā no, ziņā? No, es taisīs, taisīs vēl visādas ah, idejas, idejas, ideja attīstīs. Aha, uh, pēc... Um, Studies speak Italian. Yeah. <laughs> um, this idea uh, he has taken and developed different uh, variations of it. Uh, mm. the object, the interior, and photo montage. Okay, so uh, ideas, um, variations of this theme uh, for interior objects as well as photos. Galna funkcija ievest cilvēku pārdomu un meditācijas stāvoklī. The main object of the works uh, is to uh, transport the people into a meditative uh, state. The workers, yeah. actually. Tas ir vienlaikus visums, 
uh, it's it's at the same time the whole kura daļiņ mēs esam of which we are a small part bet es dod iespēju paskatīties no ārpus okay so this is the whole of which we are a small part and he is giving us the chance to look at it from the outside ja pateicoties uh, ribokai divi un arī uh, rebeka skunze ja uh, šo ideju pirmo reizi izdevās realizēt pienācīgā mērogā. So thank you uh, thanks to Riboka too and uh, to Rebecca uh, this is the first Pirmā time reize. the very first time that he has Jā. been able to realize this Jā. work uh, in a an appropriate uh, manner. Jā. Absolutely. Tā, ļoti He's very yeah. happy. We are so happy. <laughs> we are extremely honored because uh, 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 we come. Oh yes. Yes, this is where the magic happens, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So indeed, we're extremely touched because uh, if anything, like uh, the, the role and the mission of the biennial is, is to support artists. And um, what you have seen is like many, many, many new productions. Um, and this one is, of course, an historical one. That was, it was imagined by Valdis in the 70s and, and which was never developed and pursued because of uh, the lack of finances of political um, uh, possibilities. And so it's a fantastic achievement to see that we uh, could help Valdis to realize one of this uh, positron work. Thank you very much, Valdis. Please, Thank please, you. Please. <laughs> see you. So yes, the, the artists uh, are uh, close to their works, which is always a good sign. This was not pr uh, programmed or planned, but uh, it's quite fantastic that uh, that we could speak a bit with uh, with Valdis, who's such an important figure uh, in the Latvian uh, Baltic uh, and I think international art scene. It's just about his work uh, being rediscovered. Uh, so you see, we just went into a part that was um, questioning or interrogating or putting into perspective our relationship with machines, and here we. Um, go in the same, uh, following the same question around the idea of progress, um, around utopia, the moment where we are um, asking about different types of spiritualities or theories that we can basically develop as humans and that would help us to somehow uh, understand our position or the transformation of our position within the world. We are now uh, lying on... <laughs> on the, uh, the, the, the ashes of the project of the Institute of Cosmos, which uh, is an institute that is devoted to the research around the cosmism, the Russian cosmism. So this started with, uh, amongst others, like uh, the figure of Fedorov, um, uh, a Russian um, literature writer, and who was studying the possibility of a new human. They were uh, thinking a lot about the question of immortality, about the transformation of the human, about uh, uh, getting rid of genders, for example, and really trying to put together theories of transformation. The work uh, we could not ship as well. It was lots of archives, like a project by uh, different artists. And so we decided that the most uh, relevant way to support the project and help it to carry on was actually to make a website. So now you can find uh, the, the a website that is dedicated to this project on which you have numerous contributions of research uh, around the cosmism. And, uh, and which is something that is also very pleasing because this way it can last and it can be also accessible to all of you. So it's cosmism.art, uh, the website, if you are curious about it. Um, here we have um, a proposition by uh, Marion Rolls. Marion Rolls is a, a designer collective uh, who are from Riga. And basically you might have seen them during our visit. Uh, the invigilators of the biennial are wearing these costumes uh, that you discover here. Basically the idea was to ask Marion Rolls to imagine costumes for uh, unknown futures. And this was uh, like way before COVID, uh, uh, COVID pandemic happened. It was like, okay, we, now, uh, we are now at the crossroad of epochs and we kind of, we don't really have costumes 
costumes that are ready for that situation. So what they propose is to reuse this textile that was used by the Soviet army, and so that is extremely loaded in terms of values. And for them, it was almost like a, uh, almost problematic to use it. They were really not comfortable. They're like, for us, this is like wearing, uh, I mean, carrying so much history that we we feel that we are doing something that is almost a political gesture, you know, to kind of reclaim this textile that used to be uh, the symbol of order, that used to be the symbol of oppression as well, and to transform it for um, basically wearing, uh, for it to be worn by the invigilators, who are more or less the, the sound, uh, the, the, the ears, the eyes, the, the speech of the whole project and the, of all of the artists, because they share it with the visitors. So what happens with these costumes is that um, you can transform in many different ways. So as you wish, you can uh, uh, put them around you and protect yourself with it. And if it's cold, you can put it as a backpack. If it's, um, if it's warm, you can uh, um, put it as almost like looking like the Pope of some religious uh, figure. You can look like you're in your pajamas. I've tried them and I've been like basically transforming my identity as much as I was transforming um, the textile. Uh, and, and its position. So it's very much uh, uh, kind of the, a monument, the costume of a new army that is an army of the unknown, of the uncertainty. And this uh, symbol that you see here is a symbol that is extremely important to the Latvian um, culture that is uh, the sign of harvest, that is the sign of collaboration between humans and whatever resources that are uh, around. And this is something that you would find a lot on top of the doors of houses, that is a sign of protection and of call for uh, um, uh, fertility and, uh, and um, prolific uh, production. So we are now working, it's the end soon. Uh, bear with me because uh, we are encountering uh, the last sections of the, of the show. Here we have Michaelis Fischers. Michaelis Fischers is an artist from uh, Riga who's uh, been thinking about the question of collapse and of creation of worlds and, uh, and of beliefs. And what he wants, he was like interested in the fact that we always imagine that the universe or our world has been man-made as we portray it through different types of gods that are like uh, um, uh, yeah, humans. And he wanted here to propose a monument to ab an abstract creation of the world. And these balloons that you see here are basically expanding like uh, as they go as they go as they go until they will explode but no one knows like when things will explode so this is very much about the idea of creation but also the idea of explosion and the idea of the uh, unknown and the worship of something might explode as I'm speaking to you um, something that we cannot control and uh, that we cannot master behind him is the work of Timo Sequin so Timo Sequin has been uh, interested for uh, many years now uh, in creating a new religion. Uh, he's saying that basically, a bit like Félix Gattari actually, Félix Gattari in a book that he was done, uh, he published in, uh, in the 90s was saying, nothing will change with us until we haven't changed our mental ecologies. There is no way of speaking about structural, economical, political changes if the mental, if our understanding of the world hasn't been transformed. And building on this, uh, Timo Sekin has been proposing this new piece, a uh, religion that is based on basically uh, uh, the recognition of the forces of nature as the prevalent forces that are around us. And that's why here he's been building together an hotel, an hotel that is dedicated to the gods of Latvia because uh, in Latvia you still have lots of places that are sacred where people worship forests or, or sacred stones and this is one of them and again a bit like Michaelis Fischer the human figure has totally disappeared uh, from this landscape. Another proposition about uh, this question of past and future and the uh, arisal of uh, erasing of, uh, of the human figure like uh, through this uh, absolutely terrible and incredibly uh, radical moment of human history, which is the bomb, uh, atomic bombing, uh, is the work by uh, Onka Saloniemi Virtanen, um, a collective that is, uh, has been elaborating a, a film around the Trinity. The Trinity is the only stone that has been made, made that has been created after the first atomic bombing in New Mexico in 44. Um, so this, basically what we discover here in this, uh, in this uh, little, um, 
uh, window is the Trinity, which is this stone that, uh, that was, uh, as I was telling you, created back then. And this uh, back then was used a lot in the uh, United States as propaganda for the expression of beauty. So women were used a lot, beautiful women, were used a lot as a kind of a trophies that would be wearing this actually very radioactive stone to express the power of humans, to express the power, a power that is so limitless that you actually uh, transform the world and the geological reality that is surrounding you. So this movie is very much about this moment that is this moment of total atrocity and the end of every type of life that is an atomic bombing, but also like the incredible uh, egocentric nature of humans that have been claiming uh, the creation of an ultimate and absolutely uh, terrible beauty that is incarnated by the Trinity. I will tell you about Margarita Sumo artwork. Follow me. I have to stay close to you because I have the mic. Yeah. Here, at the surface of the ocean, floats a heavy, deflated flesh of marine mammal. Upside down, half submerged, it fins wide open, facing up. The body has transluence of human skin, and at the bottom that it touches the water, a spreading bruise of purple shade. It's sometimes hurt, shuddering through death, breathing back to life, abruptly, but quietly. Soon, it might just be a floating waste, but as now, it looks at the cosmos in the search of answer. The body seems to slowly elevate itself. Its soul, later, is heard circling around the space. Thank you. Uh, so here you saw um, the incarnation of a work that uh, could not be brought here, which is uh, the work by Marguerite Chimot. So basically the sculpture, the monumental sculpture of a dying whale that was supposed to be presented here in this space uh, could not be shipped. And uh, instead the artist Marguerite proposed that a uh, human being will be welcoming you and will be kind of bringing your imaginary together to imagine what the work was supposed to be. Um, this work is following uh, an hypothesis from Marguerite Chumeau that the animals, as they are witnessing their extinction, will be developing uh, spirituality and that they will be basically calling for higher forces to come to save us as they see their peers disappear. Um, so Marguerite Humeau is an artist who's always been interested in, uh, in the sensitivity, in the spirituality, in the consciousness of others, uh, which are not uh, consciousness that we have an easy access to. She's just calling for humans to try to understand other ways of building worlds that might not be ours. This being said, we will go to a uh, another type of spirituality which is embodied by this tribe uh, that you see here and that is part of a proposition by Nikolai Smirnov. Nikolai Smirnov is a geographer uh, from Russia who's been studying what he called the religious libertarians. What he's been very interested in is like how different individuals or collective has been building together like different types of spirituality that are absolutely not like the mono uh, uh, monoculture or like uh, um, dominating spiritualities that we know. And here you have uh, one of them because we were not able to display all of them, but these are costumes that are used by um, um, a tribe from, from Latvia. And this tribe is about arising the earth. Basically, all of their outfits are calling uh, for like, or are made of different instruments that would be used to kind of make lots of noise. Here, this wood, this stick would be basically carried on the floor and the idea is that the earth becomes aware of their presence of our presence and the earth will start then to be extremely prolific would start to uh, um, to basically uh, build together like plants and, and and would help with the harvest and the culture so this is very much a, a tribe that is uh, still nowadays trying to enter into a collaboration and a very respectful relationship uh, with the forces of the earth we are now uh, getting to the work of uh, Maximov, Mikhail Maximov, who's been uh, as well. So as you can understand, here is um, all of this uh, moment was about spirituality and uh, 
moments of, of uh, understanding the world and how to uh, exist within it. And this one is a proposition for an agency that is called Europa that would enable you to live at the last moment the death of someone that you want to encounter. And so this idea for uh, Maximov is basically to study a very gray zone of our culture, which is like, uh, and that is for him like not at all uh, uh, embraced, which is the possibility of living the last moments and the disappearance uh, of someone uh, who's losing its life. It's again um, what I was telling you about this terrible fear that our culture has about disappearing and the kind of uh, permanent mastership we want to put on being conserved, on like not decaying, on not showing traces of the time passing through our, uh, our faces by hiding riddles and so on and so forth, like hiding our uh, white hairs. Why are we obsessed by this idea of conservation? In the contrary here, like the artist uh, Mikhail Maximov is calling for other ways of perceiving like a, a moment of, uh, of death and disappearance. I was a moment that could be like um, um, just just shared and and, and uh, at least uh, at least uh, interrogated. And now we are going to the last work. The last work is uh, the work by Cyprien Gaillard, which is called Ocean to Ocean, and that of course uh, tells about dust to dust. Um, the idea that uh, from this uh, here the submarine life where. Uh, carriages from the metro are being thrown because of the lack of coral um, and the need for submarine life to thrive again. Uh, but also, like you will see, like these corals that are being used in the Russian metro in Moscow. Like so, you know this uh, permanent cycle. This is basically uh, uh, what uh, Cyprien Gaillard is going through in this work: is the idea that uh, things are mutating, they, they morph, they go from one place, they re-inhabit another space, they are rebirthed. Um, uh, in another era, in another moment, is basically um, uh, as a last work a call or a moment in this uh, in this age where we're like so afraid about the end, the end of an era, the end of an epoch, and the unknown epoch that will happen. Um, the idea or a call for understanding that there might not be such a thing as endings. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of the. Biennial. I mean, that's not the end of the biennial, but uh, oh, I'm, I'm actually, come with me, because that's not the end of the biennial at all. Uh, <laughs> there will be through, uh, and there is already like through um, all, the, all the city, collaborations with different chefs and different people that I think are very, very involved every day into re-enchanting our relationship with life. And uh, here I am with uh, the representant of Casa Nostra, which is a restaurant. So three restaurants are working with us. And the idea was to give a carte blanche to imagine the flavor uh, of re-enchantment. And uh, for you, Sandra, and for all of the others to basically propose a, a, a creative proposition of your interpretation of uh, what a re-enchanting time could be. Maybe you could tell us about how you understood this. We've created a menu uh, which was going to be uh, seasonal when the uh, riboka was going to be five months uh, and also during that period we had envisaged having long tables uh, where people could eat together and experience and share thoughts as well as the food and because of COVID we're not able to do that but instead what we've done uh, is uh, created, a, put up a canvas in the shape of a, a large table and we're inviting people to express their thoughts on re-enchantment in the form of uh, uh, awakening, purification, uh, regeneration uh, and enjoying this through the simplicity of the Italian food that we're uh, presenting vegetarian, of course. Yeah, thank you very much. So I will leave you with uh, some images uh, on Cyprien uh, Ocean to Ocean uh, proposition and, um, and his call uh, as well that is so important to imagine that we are, uh, we are just in transformation and there is not such thing as a disappearance. Thank you very much. I wish you a beautiful day and uh, yes, yeah, see you soon. Bye bye.